Before talking about Parkinson's, I don't know what you all know about Parkinson's and what causes it, because most people don't seem to know anything about what causes it. It's quite simple. The brain is, in, is short of one very complex chemical. It's called GDNF. I'll explain that to you in a few minutes. The lack of GDNF in the subconscious brain area causes you to have a, a, a deficit of everything that you do without having to think about it. For instance, walking is a problem, bringing food to your mouth is a problem. Um, most things that you, that you do without thinking what you're doing, I don't think what my legs are doing, or I didn't used to, and what my legs are doing and my arms are doing when I'm walking. So anything like that, so bringing food to my mouth without spilling it, I've got this lovely shake, I hold it differently and it doesn't shake. Now, um, the cause therefore, this GDNF, the lack of GDNF, the obvious solution to um, reverse Parkinson's disease is to either take in more GDNF or create more GDNF. Now, unfortunately, you could take, um, they, they make artificial GDNF, but you can't get it into the brain because it will not pass the blood-brain barrier. So, how do you get it? How did I get it? How did I know about it? Well, Back in 1993, I was diagnosed in 92. Back in 1993, I got the news that they had done a study in the French A Hospital in, in Bristol, in England. And they, got, they um, took six patients, various ages, and they inserted a little pump and a, and a, a tank and uh, underneath the ribs and they took the, the cord all the way up to the brain and they inserted into this subconscious brain area here. And over a period of six months, this, they walked around and did everything they normally do with all this um, paraphernalia. And at the end of six months, every single person had got better two varying degrees, but, you know, more than 60% better. So, obviously, um, GDNF is the cause of Parkinson's. Now, the doctors know this, and everybody else knows this, except the patients. But it's not that simple. How do we produce more GDNF? Now, this is, um, I can't think of the term, but... A bit of magic because I was diagnosed in 1992 and I immediately started I'm a workaholic so I'd spend my life working on the computer don't do anything so I started going to the gym and I went for 90 minutes a day six days a week and over the next two years I went every day other than Sundays my wife went to a, something called Walk for Life. Now, I don't know if there is Walk for Life still in South Africa or anywhere in the world, but it's organized walking with the time you or you time yourself and they keep records. So you keep on trying to walk faster and faster and faster. So I went and so my wife joined Walk for Life when I was diagnosed. She realize that you know i'm going to go downhill and she needs something to and take her mind away from these things so she a friend got her to join walk for life with her and within months she lost i don't know how much 14 kilograms in weight i don't know how many months and she felt so good she really felt better than she thinks she's ever felt before and this is my late wife I'm talking about. And she said to me after two years, John, 
and you're not getting better with all this um, and this exercise that you're doing in the gym. I said, no, I'm getting worse. Not knowing whether it's worse than I would normally get if I didn't do the gym or whatever. So she said, why don't you join Walk for Life? I said, well, if I spend 90 minutes in the gym every day, how can walking every second day for one hour help me? I mean, I'm doing walking when I'm at the gym. I'm doing all these things. She said, I don't know, but please do it. What have you got to lose? So I joined Walk for Life. Within six weeks, I started getting better. Now that's the magic that I'm talking about. As if somebody somewhere <laughs> got me to listen to my wife and go and do walk, fast walking. So I continued to get better and in 1996, that's only two, uh, two years after I started walking, most of my symptoms had disappeared. I assumed, knowing this GDNF story, I mean, I knew it before I got, after I got um, 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 diagnosed in 92, it, they did it in 93. And because of Parkinson's, I was very keen to, to, to hear this and, and know what, they, what, um, what causes it. So I assumed, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a scientist, I assumed I must be producing GDNF in my brain by doing the walking. Now, I'm going to jump ahead 20 years. In, 19, in 2019, the Mayo Clinic in um, America, somewhere in America, it's very famous, they did a study with a, quite a few people of varying ages and sexes and so forth, and they did a study of the effect of high intensity exercise, physical exercise, affects the brain. Now, uh, they, they gave it a name, um, but I can't remember the name. <laughs> Not really good at remembering anything. So, after I don't know how many months or weeks or whatever, they were able to measure the GDNF content of the brain before and an hour after walking, which is what I was doing every second day. And they found that the, the volume of GDNF in the brain after the walking was higher than what they needed in order to function properly. So they know that one hour of high intensity that's the secret, high intensity aerobic exercise, not just any odd exercise. Walking, you can, running is high intensity exercise, but nobody can run flat out for an hour. You just can't do it. But you can walk flat out for an hour. You can walk flat out for 10 hours when you've had a lot of practice. So it's possible to walk flat out. And my time to start off with with, with Walk for Life from memory, I, I think it took me 11 or 12 minutes to do a kilometre. At the end of the two-year period that I'm talking about, I, I'm not lying, I think I got down to seven minutes a kilometre from 11. And I've maintained that. I've carried on walking every second day since I joined Walk for Life. And we moved and then I left Walk for Life and I'll be carried on doing the walking. I walk around our suburb early in the mornings before the traffic and before people and so forth and dogs. And, and um, I've done that. The only time I haven't done it is if I've had any other medical problems, which we all have. You can't walk when you've got flu and you can't walk when you've got this and that and you injure yourself. But every available time that I've had, every second day, six o'clock in the morning, in the dark, in the sun, whatever, I've gone out and done my one hour walking. And since 1996, I live, have lived a normal life, with the one exception. I have to consciously think what I'm doing all the time, with walking and bringing food to my mouth. 
So how do you do that? Well, it's pretty easy. I just want to use an, 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 a story. I've got lots of stories. Um, I was in the um, stadium, in the hall of the stadium, where they play rugby, Twickenham Stadium in London. And there were hundreds of people there, and there were a large number of them had Parkinson's. This was a meeting organized as many Parkinson's patients as possible. One guy at the end of the meeting, he only got to the meeting at the end because he had to push himself in his wheelchair. And he said, can you tell me how to walk? So I said, can you stand up on your own two feet? He said, yes, but I can't walk. So I said, well, that's easy. So in front of all these people, and I'm not expecting anything, I get rather, <laughs> um, um, you know, Ang uh, not anxious, you know, it, it makes me cry. He, he got up and I held onto his arm. He was standing and I said to him what I say to everybody else. Stand upright and I want your head to be upright. I don't want to see you standing like this. I want you to see you standing like that. So he stood like that and I said, now, when your feet together, feet together, I said, now, I want you to concentrate on putting all your weight on your left leg. And I was doing the same next to him. So he put all his weight on his left leg. I said, now show me how far you can get your right leg up in front of you. And he stuck his leg out like that in front of me, him. I said, right, put it down. Stand on your right leg and show me how far you can move your leg, left leg in front of you. And his left leg went up exactly the same height. I said, can you stand on your toes? And he said, yes, I can stand up on my toes. And he stood up on his toes. I said, um, okay, how high can you point? Point it like that. So I said, I can't remember his name. Why can't you walk? He said, because I've got Parkinson's. I said, but you've just shown me you can do everything you need to do when you walk. You can swing your arms. You can stand on your toes. You can move your leg out in front of you. I want you to now walk with me, because you can. So he stood next to me and holding his hand um, with my elbow, right angles like this. And I said, right now, legs together, put your weight on your left leg. Show me how far the, the right leg can come out. And his right leg came out and I said, right now, stand on the heel. And off we went. And he was walking within a few seconds. And he walked around the whole hall with me once. And then he walked around on his own a second time. Now here's a man from a wheelchair, within minutes, is walking normally. Only because it's not a miracle, he had to use this part of his brain instead of this part of his brain. That's the magic. That's the simple part of it. And you can't do it lying in bed. You can't, you've got to, in order to be able to walk fast, you have to practice. Is it so hard if you can walk, even if you can't walk because of Parkinson's, if you can walk, you don't have one leg or what <laughs> something missing, then you've got to walk as fast, um, as fast as you can for one hour, but you can't start at one hour. If you start at two minutes, that's fine. Walk as fast as you can for two minutes and stick to that for two, two weeks, every second day for two weeks. And then the, on the first day of the third week, you walk as fast as you can, as far as you can. And you will gradually go up every two weeks. You'll go up and up until, and with me it was four months later that I got to one hour. With some people it's one and a half um, years before they get to that. I, I'm, I'm quite a strong young man at that stage. I was in my 40s, um, 92, 94, um, three, 60s. I was in my 60s. And I've always been quite strong. And um, if, you, if you do this exercise, it's the only way I can know or anybody knows to reverse Parkinson's 
is to do high intensity aerobic exercise. Exactly that. And the only aerobic exercise you can do for an hour is fast walking. People have asked me, I do boxing. I said, that's lovely, you know. You can't do this for one hour, you know, and your legs are going from, um, everything must work flat out and you must be out of breath doing it, you know. And walking, where's the problem with walking? Some people seem to think, oh, nobody wants to walk. I've got a car, you know, ride a, ride a horse or a bicycle. Who wants to walk, you know? Well, it's the only way you're going to get out of being uh, um, shackled with this Parkinson's is to become strong, your legs become strong, your breathing is better, your heart rate is better, everything gets better, and you have this benefit of overcoming Parkinson's. So, I, I made a few notes. Um, uh, I just want to talk about GDNF. GDNF stands for glial derived neurotrophic factor. Neurotrophic is nerve. Glial cells are the brain cells that manage the production of GDNF in your brain. So GDNF is glial-derived neurotrophic factor. So um, I've already told you about the, the test that they did with artificial GDNF that was pumped into the brain because it can't pass, can't put it into the stomach and into the bloodstream. It won't get through to the brain because of the blood-brain barrier, right, and walk for life. Now, um, when I am in 19, I, I was the chairman of the Parkinson's Association of South Africa for, for quite a number of years, after I got Parkinson's, of course. And at some time after I'd learned how to walk and I started going around to to different group being the chairman I was able to go to all the group meetings. I went to group meetings in Pretoria and all over Johannesburg, Cape Town, Durban, Port Elizabeth, all at my own expense to show people how to walk and there has never been one single instance where the person I was teaching couldn't do it on their own. Okay, So nobody can say that no, I don't think I can do it. I know that everybody can do it, unless they've got some other physical problem that prevents them from walking. So I, I went all over the country, and all of a sudden, some bigwig, I don't want to mention names, came to me and he said, I want you to resign. I said, why well, must I resign? He said, because you're misleading patients. You're telling them you are cured. There is no cure for Parkinson's. Therefore, you don't have Parkinson's. So please, we want you to leave. This, of course, comes from the medical industry or the, the, the drugs industry. They can't afford everybody with Parkinson's to stop using medication. That's my assumption. And um, I'll apologise if it's not true. But I can't think of any other person with any other reason would fabricate that, I, that I'm claiming to be cured and there's no cure for Parkinson's, therefore I don't have Parkinson's. So I said, well, I, I went and addressed the next meeting and, and two people got up and proposed that I resign. Proposed and seconded, I had no option but to resign. So since then, my late, no, my, my late wife, no, my, my wife died in, 2011. Before that time I had been demonstrating all over South Africa regularly at my own expense and I started communicating with um, making connections with people all over the English-speaking world and my current wife we got married in 2012 it's 2013. Since then I hope the level is okay with my voice. Um, since then, we've been to every English-speaking country, England and some non-English-speaking. England, Holland, France, Switzerland, Italy, um, and New Zealand, Australia, America, Canada, 
can't think of left any too many out of that lot, all the English speaking countries. And we got the locals everywhere we went to organize these same meetings that I told you about at the, um, the, the rugby stadium. And everywhere we went, I've had people in wheelchairs, people with crutches, you know, with Parkinson's, not other problems. And they have all been able to walk normally, within minutes. I know a lot of them don't continue to do it, particularly women. Now, I don't understand that. They've been shown that they can walk. And when they're holding my arm, they can walk as long as you like without me carrying them. I'm not, it's just the fact that I'm holding their arm, they seem to have the confidence to just walk normally. The moment I let go, they can't walk because their brain tells them they can't walk. Although they're doing it. I can't explain that. It's, it's, it's just one of these uh, mysteries to me. But most people that I do show do walk. And I, I keep in contact with a lot of people. Um, I, I get 30 or 20 or 30 emails a day from people that I've to, you know, shown that have heard about me, whatever. And I spend most of my life um, speaking to other people with Parkinson's. And I've written several books about it. And, I mean, the one book, I'm not going to advertise it. Um, but everybody knows Reverse Parkinson's Disease is the first book I've written. And it gives all the information I've given you, plus a lot more. And um, I, I then wrote um, about myself, not about Parkinson's, but myself and Parkinson's. For, for people, you know, it's funny, this. Most people think other people have got some advantage over them. They don't. They can't do this. Like, are you lucky you can do that? With this, everybody can walk. I know everybody can walk unless they've got something physically preventing it. So why can't they learn to walk properly? They, I've shown them how to do it. Why don't they want to do it? Why don't they want to get better? A lot of them do. I get some wonder in my books. My first book. Um, I, I put a whole list of 40 names or more of people who've written emails to me and said, this is what's happening and this is going well. And thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, um, I mean, there's a hell of a lot more that don't, have never written to me or anything like that, but I, I don't ask anybody to write to me. And I mean, I've had people from Japan. Now, how did they get hold of it? Japan, um, Romania, all the English-speaking countries. And... Um, it's. Uh, I think the whole world, in a way, is getting to know about fast walking. And um, I get, I'm just having a look at this. Um, I did say the Mayo Clinic, didn't I? And then they, they did this measurement of exactly how much GDNF. And if you walk longer, you produce nothing extra. It stops producing after an hour, but it's already produced enough to, for the brain's need. And that brain, the brain uses it all the time, so it needs it all the time, except when you sleep, because it's it's only needed for movement, movement that you do consciously. I'm not a doctor. I'm not. I have no a very little education. I don't have my trick. I left school um, before um, when I was 16 because my father needed me to work. And I worked in a bank for four or five years. I came to South Africa in that time. And I worked in the same bank in South Africa for, for say, four or five years. And then I started selling accounting machines for another four or five years. And then I, I started a, a business printing. And that printing business grew to be the largest printing business in the country printing computer stationery, because computers and myself and printing all go together. And we got the, the, the biggest single printing company in the country, and we went public on the stock exchange. And this is somebody without any real education, without having any instruction from anybody else as how to do this. But it's all in my makeup. 
I come from a very poor family. I know what it is to work and, and to, and to um, feel the underdog. And I, I put a lot of thought into running that company and I treated my staff as equals. I treated them as human beings, whether they were black, coloured or white. And we were a team and when we had two factories, we, we had one, one factory here in Cape Town, a big one in, in um, Atlantis, and um, one in Johannesburg and another one in Cape Town, in Durban. And all the people gave their everything in that business because they wanted it to be successful. It wasn't a case of, it's five o'clock, I'm going home. They'd look at their watches and if they finished what they're doing, they would go home. They would wait until they were finished before they went home. They all had this desire to, to make this business successful and it was very successful. I can't take the, the, the credit for most of it because I'm sitting in an office most of the time or traveling around the world. And I was asked to join an American printing association and I was on that board for three years. And why did they want somebody from South Africa on their board? Because I was doing things differently. And that, I think, sums up my life. I do things differently. If, I, if everybody's having trouble doing something, find a different way to do it and then you don't have any trouble if you succeed. So in business, I was successful. I'm not bragging about it. And in my private life, life, I was married to Shirley for 51 years. She died suddenly in, in, in 2011. And I was without anybody for the next um, 18 months, 15 months. And I had this need to go to all these countries to show them how to walk. I'm getting letters, emails and so forth. So I sent the message out, I'm ready to come and you've got to organise it. You have to pay for the airfare and you have to pay, you have to put me up or do something. But I will be there free of charge and go to all of these places. And I've been to hundreds of places and spoken to thousands of people. And they've all, it's all been a wonderful success for those who want it to be a success. Now, I still face doctors regularly who tell me I don't have Parkinson's disease. That's without examining me. I've been examined by four neurologists who all say I have Parkinson's disease. The first one was the first one, obviously, when the first in 1992. I went and saw another one. You've heard of Dr. Uh, you wouldn't have heard of Dr. Norman Deutsch. When Norman Deutsch came here to see me because he wrote about my story in one of his books, it's on the bookshelf over there, and he said, I want, I want to have a, a meeting with you and a neurologist. So please be my guest. So we went to the neurologist's office and we, they um, photographed it, like you're doing at the moment, did a video of me talking to this female, a lovely lady, I won't mention her name, in Johannesburg. And she agreed with me 100%. She didn't say this to me, but, she's, but she indicated that I'm going to face a lot of flack from the medical world. And I can understand that. This is their living and I'm taking it away from them. And they're, 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 what they tell everybody is, I don't have Parkinson's, therefore don't listen to what I'm saying. A lot of people listen to that. I mean... Who am I? Don't even have a trick telling them don't don't take a medication to the, the the walking. Now, no medication does anything to reverse in other words, make the Parkinson's better, reverse it. None of there's not a medication in the world that will reverse Parkinson's disease. There's one type of medication which will slow down the progression of, of Parkinson's disease. And I was on that for two years. It's known as an MAOB inhibitor, monoamine oxidase inhibitor. That means it inhibits the breakdown of, of the GDNF in the brain. So therefore you've got 
long, more use of the GDNF that you've got. It slows it down. It's not giving you more GDNF. It's slowing down the breakdown of GDNF in the brain. So, um, all of this was Dr. Deutsch coming here and the, 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 um, the neurologist agreeing with everything I'm saying and with, um, you know, quite um, taken back by it. I went with Deutsch to Durban and Cape Town and spoke to people and he, he speaks about a much wider range of taking control, conscious control of what you're doing. And um, everybody in the world, I think, knows Dr. Norman Deutsch. And um, he climbed up uh, Table Mountain, not Table Mountain, um, where, where's the lookout? Oh, the, the, the end of the uh, peninsula, what is it? Cape Point. Oh. <laughs> He's 20 or 30 years younger than me and he couldn't beat me to the top. <laughs> he did try. <laughs> anyway. Um, he, he went all around the country with me and he was totally fascinated with what had happened and he saw people, I showed him, taking people who weren't able to walk and in front of him showed them how to walk and they walked. So why the medical profession, I do know why, they don't want you to get better because they lose money. That sounds terrible. And I may be 100% wrong, but I don't think so. You must make your own decision. But if you know something that works, which I've told you, that works, and you can do it, which everybody can, and you don't, you've got yourself to blame. No medication will ever get re reverse your Parkinson's disease. I'm not anti-medication. I took medication for two years. I got better quicker after I stopped taking medication. Well, the few words that I'd like to say is to give you the um, strength to not listen to what other people are saying and for you to find out yourself what you can do. If you learn how to use your conscious brain, I have to use my conscious brain for everywhere I walk, everything I eat, I have to think about what I'm doing, otherwise I shake like this and I throw it all over the place. If I do it with the other hand, which uh, my left hand doesn't have Parkinson's. So if I were to use my left hand to eat and drink, um, I wouldn't have to do the conscious thing. So I also I found ways of doing things differently. You just imagine I've got a glass in my hand. Normally I bring the glass like this and then I get there and this is what happens. But if I turn my hand around and hold the glass, you see it's not shaking because I'm consciously doing that, I'm not consciously doing this. It's my subconscious brain, this bit in here, that is um, shaking. It doesn't shake here, okay. Now, that's shaking, but if I turn my wrist, it stops shaking, because I have never drunk something with my hand like this. Within a certain period of time, like writing, when I write, I have to write very slowly because I've got to concentrate on the letter and being slow, being that I can read it, otherwise I can't read it at all. I write everything in capital letters, as big as you can get. You see, my writing is not very good and it's very <laughs> shaky. And I did it in the pen because I can't see it otherwise. <laughs> and um, so have belief in yourself and don't listen to what other people tell you. Find out for yourself what you can and what you can't do. And then work at it. One hour, three times a week is not a lot of time to spend to get better. In fact, it's a great pleasure. And boy, when I'm sick and I've, I've had heart problems and I've had brain problems and I've had all sorts of other problems, I still go out and walk when I can. And um, I haven't walked now for the last three months. So I've got um, um, prostate cancer and I've had uh, certain things removed <laughs> and uh, you know, I've been in and out of hospital with that and I've been in and out of hospital with, with my heart. I did a, a five and a half hour operation, I think, um, into the heart ablation. 
um, and they clean the hot the valves and the hot. Anyway, I had to do all that and other uh, medical problems. But I'm 88 years of age, and I'm, I'm as healthy as most other people of a lot younger. And um, my knees at the moment are the last thing that have been injured by this all this walking, and um, I've got to do something about them. But uh, at my age, I'm, I'm thinking, well, I really don't want to um, put too much into this walking or anything else. At 88, what am I hanging around for? You know, it's um, I, I don't want to die, but. It is hard work at my age, walking <laughs> for an hour. And um, with all these troubles that I've had, I've just got used to not walking for one hour, but walking when I can and how, how fast I can. So um, I don't know what else to say to, to, to anybody. Um, have faith in yourself and, and make it happen. It, 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 there's nobody who can't do it. So that means you, and then if you haven't tried it and you don't don't stick to it, you've got yourself to blame. Some people like to be sick. They like people to feel sorry for them. I mean, some people, they, they really like to be, oh, oh gosh, you know, I can't do this. Oh, shame. Oh, shame. I'd rather not hear, oh, shame. I'd rather hear, how? Oh, how did you do that? You know, and that's what... I want to hear this. I want to see people getting better. And I want to see people have faith in themselves. And um, anyway, I hope I've helped whoever is watching. And um, I wish you all the best, everybody.